Welcome to season 12 of the Parenting Aces podcast, a proud member of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and this week we have with us two former college coaches, Danielle McNamara and Tanner Stump, who are here to discuss the differences between focusing on long-term development in our junior players versus staying focused on performance-based outcomes like wins and losses and ratings and rankings. The two of them have incredible, incredible insights into what the differences are and how we as parents can best support our kids through this whole junior tennis journey, um, especially if college tennis is the goal for them. They have both also graciously offered to do a follow-up episode to answer any questions that y'all might have after watching or listening to this one. So I want to encourage you to leave questions in the comments on ParentingAces.com, to tweet at me, to text me, to email me, to post them in our Facebook group, um, however you like to communicate. But Danielle and Tanner have both graciously offered their time to do another podcast or maybe even a webinar if that's what y'all would prefer to have. So please let me know. This is for you after all. And I am thrilled to bring to you Danielle McNamara and Tanner Stump. Enjoy. I am so excited to have you guys on today, Danielle and Tanner. This is a conversation that I've had several times, but never had with two former college coaches. So I'm super excited for the parents out there to get to hear your perspectives on what it means to focus on long-term development as opposed to being so focused in on wins and losses with their junior players. Before we jump into the conversation, though, Tanner, since it's your first time with us, um, would you mind giving us a little bit of your tennis story, how you got started in the sport and um, kind of where your journey went and what you're doing now? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, it's great to be here with uh, both you, Lisa and Danielle. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to talk a little bit about college tennis today, which I love. Um, it's been a big part of my life, tennis in general. Uh, actually, my sister's the one who originally got me into the sport. She started playing first. Um, she's two years older than me, and I was purely a soccer player at the time. And then uh, just by watching her play and going to some tournaments and stuff, I caught the bug myself and decided to pick up a racket and start playing. And so that was in uh, Corpus Christi, Texas. And uh, about the age of 10 is when I started. So I was a little bit late uh, in, in terms of the sport and how early people typically start, but uh, immediately fell in love with it and switched uh, to playing tennis full time around the age of 12, which coincided with our family moving to Florida um, due to some some family health issues and also my parents wanting to give me uh, as many opportunities as I could as a player. Uh, we moved to Bradenton, Florida and uh, spent some time at IMG and then uh, was at IMG for a little bit and bounced around to some smaller academies from there um, before I found the right fit for me in terms of my um, the coaching style and things that I was looking for and developed enough to have opportunities to play at the Division One level. So took visits to uh, a couple SEC schools, Alabama and Mississippi State. Uh, Mississippi State was just having a coaching turnover. And so wanted to go there to see how they would flip a program and uh, had the opportunity to have four really good years where they took the program from uh, outside the rankings to top 20. And that uh, encouraged me even more so to pursue um, college coaching as a career. And so for 11 years, I was in College coaching uh, at four different schools, uh, Middle Tennessee State, Furman University, back to Mississippi State to coach. And then my last six years were at uh, University of Florida. And so um, because of the demands of the job of being a college coach and traveling all the time and everything, I've got three kids now. And it was just a little too much for our young family for me to continue in the profession. So I stepped down last summer, so it's been about a year since I started my own business called College Tennis Crash Course, and basically what I do now is offer consulting and coach education for um, programs across the country that want to continue to learn and get better and improve and uh, refine their practices, so that's what I'm up to now. 
I love that. I love that. So you consult with the actual college tennis programs. Um, you're not working with players or parents, but. Um... So I, I do a little bit on the other side as well. I actually work with a Dutch company called Slam Stocks, and they are responsible for helping place players from all over the world here in the U.S. Um, and that is growing to an American market here, too, for those that feel like they need some help with the process. So I am involved on both sides of the equation. Um, but, but mainly, uh, what I did when I started last summer was to, to start the consulting and, and help out college coaches themselves. Love that. Love that. Danielle, you are a returning guest. So, um, pardon me if I don't give you quite as much time <laughs> to give us your tennis background, but, um, really quickly kind of take us from your tennis coaching to actual, um, other coaching that you're doing now, yeah. not on the court. Yeah, no, sure thing. Thanks, Lisa. It's so great to be here with you guys. Um, so college coaching, I started out as an assistant coach at Yale, which I then became the head coach at for uh, a total of 13 years. And then I also was the head women's coach at Texas uh, for a short bit there in the middle. So um, was a was a longtime college coach like Tanner with with two younger kids. I stepped down from my position two summers ago, and now I'm working with um, younger junior players and their families to help them navigate the recruiting process, and then also doing some more on court work um, and just sort of like total athlete development um, with all all types of athletes. So that's what I'm doing now. Love it, love it. Well. The impetus behind this whole conversation was an email that I got from Danielle saying, um, hey, I was having this really great conversation with Tanner. He's the former Florida assistant. He's got like this great kind of approach to athletic development and how it helps prepare kids to play in college. Is that a conversation you'd be interested in having on the podcast? And I was like, oh my God, yes, let's do it. So let's get into that. Can you both kind of start us off by giving us your definition of what it means to be in development as a junior player? Who wants to start? Yeah, Danielle, jump us, jump off here. All right. So from a junior player's perspective, I feel like development, first of all, should be the long-term picture of what is the type of player that I ultimately want to be? What do they look like? How do they play? Not just style, but, but everything about it. When you close your eyes and you think about and you picture yourself and your ideal player, how are you mentally, emotionally, physically? Um, and then, and then thinking about what are the steps that I have to take from where I am now and being really honest with myself and how do I get to that ultimate point? And like, that should be the guiding sort of North star of everything that I do. Um, because that's, if you can focus on those things the most rather than the win today. And I know that is so much easier said than done. Um, I feel like a, you're more likely to get there and B it's probably going to be a lot more enjoyable. Tanner. Yeah, and I want to preface everything I say here by saying that I didn't do this well when I was a junior player. And so this is all lessons that have been learned probably the hard way. Um, but I'd say that my view on development now is that it's the full formation of both a player and a person throughout their entire junior career and then into their adult life. You know, I think that through college coaching, I've been able to see kind of the maturation of a junior player into a collegian and then into a professional. And that process is both on the court and off the court. And so I think development for me is, is the forming of those on court disciplines that then spill over into life. And hey, we're, we're still developing, you know, we're all going to continue to develop even as adults. And so I think that it's a long term game in terms of not just when you will be done with your tennis, but also, you know, what you'll go on to do with the skills that you gain um, through sport. There's so much focus on ratings, whether it's UTR, WTN, um, or rankings, whether that's an ITF ranking, a USTA ranking, or some other, you know, national governing bodies ranking system. 
that it makes it very difficult not to focus on the wins and losses because those wins and losses determine the rating and ranking. And all we hear as tennis parents is, oh, if your kid's not a, you know, X UTR or an X Y WTN, they're never going to get recruited. They'll never be able to play college tennis. They're not going to be good enough. Um, and even I, as a parent, when my son was a junior, I had a parent say to me, you know, if your kid wants to play college tennis, he better start winning more. And I thought, well, that's 100% out of our control, honestly. Like, I, I don't know that that's really helpful to hear that from another parent whose kid was in college and playing tennis. But so... What are we to do as parents to divorce ourselves from the wins and losses and really keep our blinders on in terms of long-term athletic development? Tanner, I'm going to let you start with that one. Okay. Yeah. So I think you hit the nail on the head with the word control. You know, it's it's all about controlling what you can control and only focusing on those factors. To to bring anything else into the picture really is just a waste of time because it's going to distract you from the things that are actually going to matter in terms of getting you better. Sure, we all want to win more. We all want to be successful. We all want to have a higher UTR or WTN or whatever it is. But without doing the right things day to day, that's going to be impossible anyways. And then people are always asking, well, should I play or shouldn't I play this tournament? And the, the reality is there's no gaming the system. If you game the system, you're going to end up in the wrong place anyways and have a horrible experience. So it's all about just taking care of the little things in my mind, controlling what you can control and then seeing how your development plays out. And the harsh reality for a lot of parents out there is you can't, you can't force your son or daughter to improve more than they're capable of improving. You have to be okay with their development and the steps that they're going to take through the process and any additional pressure that you apply on them or they feel from those external factors is really only going to hold them back and hurt their chances of doing what you hope they're going to do and what they hope they're going to do as well. Danielle, anything to add to that? No, I mean, I definitely agree. And I think I would just add, like, I think it's important from the parents perspective and the coaches perspective, the ones who are the more experienced ones sort of on the outside is how you frame the situation um, to the player. And so if, if mom and dad and coach are really talking about and emphasizing the process and performance goals and objectives and you know, the developmental plan that you have created, like if that's the main topic of conversation with the player, then the player is going to focus on those things. But if mom, dad, and coach are talking about, oh, you're playing this level two this weekend, your first round match is a 10.4, like he's, yeah, all this business. Well, then of course the player is going to focus on that as well. So I feel like what a parent or coach can control is, is the, the framework and how how um, what's being talked about and focused on with the player, especially when they're younger, because they're naturally going to just sort of turn to them for guidance. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that because kind of one of the running threads with parenting aces across all our platforms has been educating coaches as well as educating parents, because there are a lot of junior coaches out there that are focusing on wins and losses that are focusing on ratings and rankings because they've not been taught anything differently, you know, and, and so that bleeds into their style of coaching, the way they interact with the parents so that the parents then are focused on the wrong thing. And then the way they interact with the players and then the players are focused on the wrong thing. So as a parent, because you both are parents now as well, how can we help our child's coach if if we're if we have parents listening to this and these light bulbs are going off saying oh my gosh my kid's coach isn't talking this way to my kid or to me how can we approach the coach and say can we shift the narrative here that's that's tough um <laughs> i think yeah it is because i i don't know that you're 
necessarily going to be able to do that. I think it's definitely worth a conversation and, and trying and, and maybe that coach will sort of pivot and, and change their perspective or, or their focus more, which would be fantastic. I mean, I think where I would maybe focus is like when you're looking for that coach in the first place is that that's what I think about with my daughter who plays at soccer and she's, we've talked about her, Lisa, she's 11 and she's, she's about as serious as uh, with soccer as, as I was about with tennis at her age. So like, I feel like she's on a somewhat similar path, at least for now. And I think to myself, my job as the parent is I need to try to find the right environment for her to be able to then hand it over to her and let her take advantage of whatever opportunities present themselves there. And so for me, I look at all the things you're saying, like not just what is the coach's knowledge and experience and background, but like, what's their philosophy? You know, what, what is their coaching philosophy? What do they emphasize? Um, you know, their style, all of that stuff. Because I think if you can find the right environment for your child, then the rest kind of takes care of itself. So maybe that does require a tough conversation with the coach and, and perhaps even considering a change of direction. If that's, if that's what it takes, that's what it takes. But I think the environment um, is you've got to find the right fit for your kid. Yeah, that's well said. And the only thing I would add is just that, you know, I think a really good coach is able to juggle multiple balls at the same time. So they're able to keep an eye on UTR and ratings and rankings and all these things, but not let it bleed in or transfer into their communication with a 14, 15, 16, 17 year old player, you know, and so there's, there's, being able for them to talk about the processes that are involved in long-term development, but also have an understanding of how those other items work so that they can plan the appropriate schedule in terms of um, challenging the player that they're working with to continue to grow in a competitive environment and not doing it so that they'll have a higher UTR, but doing it so that they'll have competitive opportunities that actually line up with where they are in their development and what they need to do on the match court. Yeah, love that. Can you all both kind of talk about the difference between the conversations that happen between the parent and the coach versus the conversations that happen between the parent and the child or the coach and the child? Yeah, I think it's, that's a tough one. And I think it depends on the dynamic of the family, you know, how much the parent has been involved in tennis in their life, how much experience they have with the game themselves. If they have any, um, I guess, part to play in the developmental process when it comes to the X's and O's and the technical foundations of the game. And I think the lines get a little blurred when that is the case. Um, and so you have to have clearly defined roles. If, if, I was to coach my own kids, I would have to determine the times where I'm dad and the times where I'm coach. Uh, but I would always want someone there that is going to be the coach when it, when those conversations need to happen because I'm gonna be dad first. And it's just really hard as a parent to be able to navigate both sides of that. And so I would say that I would always, even with my experience and my background, I would always lean towards having a coach be a coach and have them have more of those conversations. And then I can certainly give the coach feedback and hopefully deliver lessons from that angle. But I wanna be dad more than I wanna be coach. And I wanna have their well being in mind and for them to know that at all times I have their back as my child, as opposed to, as their coach. Um, and so that's the role that I would really want to lean towards. Danielle, yeah, you're doing I mean, a lot of nodding. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I feel like I've started to experience this myself as a parent uh, working a little bit, not that I have much soccer knowledge, but still trying to help my daughter with some things and doing work on our, on the side with her and finding myself like quickly turning into coach mode, wearing that hat. And it's like, whoa. <laughs> it's hard. You've got to pump the brakes and be like, okay, no, like your mom, like Tanner was saying, she's 11. <laughs> um, and sometimes you, I do need to just kind of give myself a five second break, reset and come back because as a child, as, as a kid growing up, my dad did this for me. Um, every single day before school, growing up in high school, I hit with my dad in the morning from six to seven 30, Monday through Friday. And I remember my mom could always tell when we came home for breakfast, how the session had gone. <laughs> like it took her five seconds. 
and I mean, he was fantastic and a huge part of why I ever did anything that I did. And so most of the time it was great, but inevitably there were challenges, but it's really tough. And I just think like Tanner said, parent first is, is very important. And, and what is really um, ringing in my mind right now is a recent clip that I saw. It's a Kobe Bryant, um, like a 30 second interview with him. And he talks about when he was 11, he played in this very high level summer basketball league in Philadelphia. And so he, he was competing, young kid kind of just started out, the level was super high and he did not score one point the entire summer. And what he remembers from that experience is he was very humbled and his dad, all his dad said to him is, I don't care how many points you score, I will always love you. And he said for him, that was so freeing. That was so liberating. It was like, I could just go play. And no matter what happened, like I knew my dad would always be there for me. And that just allowed him to go after it even more. And I just try to remember that because that was really powerful. Yeah, that's huge um, to give that gift to your child of saying, you are not your wins and losses. Yep. Our relationship is not based on your wins and losses. Um, I'm your parent first. I love you regardless. I love you unconditionally. I love you despite and because. And um, yeah, it's it, it's easy from where I'm sitting today to say these things, as you guys know, because you're in the midst of it when your child is working so hard and you are spending your time and your money and your family is making sacrifices for this child to be on this developmental pathway. Sometimes it's difficult to remember to say those things and mm -hmm. to not just say them, but to remember that you really do feel that, <laughs> you know, it's easy to get sucked in. Mm -hmm. it yeah. Is. Yeah. I think the affirmations are huge. Just even to state the obvious, you know, because as for me growing up, my parents afforded me every opportunity. You know, we were traveling all over the place, playing tournaments, training at academies, things like that. And even though no one's telling me how much we're spending on that, I'm not, I'm not dumb. I right. know that it costs a lot of money. I'm hearing things myself. And, and I know that there, my dad, you know, changed his profession to, to be able to travel with me more. And even though my dad's not saying, Hey, there's a lot on the line here. I feel it. And unless he says otherwise, like, hey, son, all I need you to do is work hard, try your best. And at the end of the day, like, that's all I expect from you. That would be very freeing. But my dad never told me those things. And again, my dad was great. And he afforded me every opportunity. And we we had since, you know, been able to discuss some of those things. But in those moments as a 13-year-old, 14-year-old, I didn't know how to express that to my father figure. And so that was on him more to let me know those things and affirm me in those times where I was not doing well. I wasn't having results. I wasn't on track for what I wanted to do. And he could have just blown the doors off of, of my freedom, if you will, of being able to just express like, hey, I love you. And all that I expect of you is to, to do the most that you can with this opportunity with the pillars that we want our family to be about. What is yeah. the brand of our family? It's It's working hard. It's respecting. It's having high character. And like, if you do those things every day, then nothing else matters. And I think if more parents said that to their kids, what would happen, which isn't the reason to do it, but what would happen is they would start playing better. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I totally, I, I can remember being at tournaments. Um, I think that's probably what most kids feel is like, we're in California, you're losing in the first round, you're on court in the middle of the match going, I, I remember thinking to myself, like, not because of anything my parents said, or did, but you're just like, we just flew cross country, you know, I'm going to lose first round, like you're having these guilty feelings. Um, and so could you imagine that combined with losing, getting off the court, and then feeling anything other than supported by your parents? I don't know that I'd still be playing tennis, you know? <laughs> So, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, there's been so much focus around mental health and, and all of that in recent years, which is fantastic. But one thing that, you know, I don't think is discussed enough is the pressure that kids feel 
despite the parents' best efforts at reinforcing their love, reinforcing the family brand, as you called it, Tanner, which I think is is a really cool way to refer to, you know, the kind of the, the ethos of, of your family. Kids feel pressure that is either real or they invent it for themselves for whatever reason. And so that places even more importance on the parent to really be proactive. And even though your kid may roll their eyes or you may not think your kid is hearing you or listening to you, they do take that in when you say to them, like, I care less if you win this match. I, you know, how you do in this tournament is irrelevant in the scheme of things. Like what matters is, did you represent our family in the way that we all expect? Did you put 100% effort, whatever that means on this particular day in this particular moment? And I, you know, I think we can all use that reminder that as the adult in the relationship, and yes, this continues even when your kids are in college, you are still the adult in the relationship as the parent that, you know, we got to say these things to our kids. We got to have these conversations and, you know, whether or not we think they hear us, they do. Yeah. And if I may add one more thing, um, just, you know, if we take a page out of the book of the top professionals that are out there, they are doing really, really well because of the people they have around them, the teams that they have built. And everybody, it didn't used to be this way. It was just one coach and you, that was it. Now you have this whole team. And I think that's actually necessary nowadays because of social media and because of all the noise that's out there. You almost need these different levels of protection and voice of reason in your corner when you're going to a tournament, when you have extra pressure, because the reality is uh, kids are going to go to a tournament and you can't protect them from what their peers say or what their peers think. And so they're going to go from, let's say, a pressureless environment right into a pressure filled environment with expectations from those that are around them that they care about the most because those are the people that are their age. And so I think that's where, again, you have to make good choices with the people that you put around your child in terms of who they train with and with the coaches, with the players, when they go to tournaments, who are they surrounding themselves with there? Are they hearing the right voices there? Or are they getting inundated with the unimportant things that end up throwing them off track? So I think that's also important to remember is, yes, you do play the biggest role in that as a parent, but there are going to be a lot of other voices out there and it's making sure that they're hearing the right things the majority of the time. Is the role of the parent in this situation, and, and I want to talk about this, this team thing, is, is it the parent's job to ensure that the team all is coming at the player with a similar message of, we are in this for the long haul. We are not about winning a match this weekend, winning a tournament this weekend, or, I mean, who takes charge of that? And then if it is the parent's role, how do we do that? I mean, it's, it's easy to say, but my goodness, there, there are a lot of snake oil salesmen out there um, in all realms. And, but especially around youth sports now, because there's a lot of money to be made in youth sports. So how do we manage all of this? That's, I mean, I think it depends a little bit on the parents' tennis knowledge and background, kind of a little bit what Tanner was saying earlier. Um, you know, if you're, if you really don't know much about the sport or the pathway or, or that, then I think that the coach plays an even more important role, but like with you articulating what's important to you, like the values and the things, and I'm not talking forehands and backhands, I'm talking about like, I may not know soccer, but I really want to focus on the process here. I want, I want to come up with a developmental plan for my daughter. Um, I'd like your input on what you think her strengths and weaknesses are and the plan of how to improve those things. Cause I don't know that, but like, I, I really, like, these are, these are my priorities as the parent of this person. Like, I think you can have that conversation. If you know more about tennis, then maybe you can be a little bit more involved, but I do think it's important that whoever is in the picture that they are hearing a similar message um, and they share common values uh, together because that's what a team is. You can't have one person doing this and another person 
sending a completely different message or that shares different values, then that, that player will be so confused and probably not very happy or successful. So um, I think that's where the parent can make sure that at least those core principles are shared among whoever is a part of that team. Yeah. Yeah. So kind of getting back to the reason for this conversation and, and focusing on long-term development as opposed to focusing only on wins and losses. I would love to hear you guys kind of share what the language differences are between someone who is focused only on wins and losses and someone who is focused on long-term development and help us understand when we choose to speak with these words or phrases, we're imparting this message as opposed to this other message that we really want to be imparting. Does that make sense? Yep. Yeah. Uh, Danielle, why don't you go ahead? Me? Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, words that I think of when I think of development, I think of things just like process, process goals, performance goals. Um, it's not, did you win or did you lose? Um, or what are your result or outcome goals? It's, what are you trying to accomplish in this match? What are you working on in your game right now that you want to implement in this match? And that is going to be our measure of success. You have to redefine success, totally redefine it. It is not about wins and losses, rankings or ratings. Success, when you're thinking about development, again, is like, hey, I'm working on coming forward in my points. I'm trying to be an all-core player. In this match, if I'm able to come to the net more and finish inside the service box, like, you know, however you want to measure that, then, then I have taken a step forward. I have gotten better. And therefore, that is success. If I win, great. If I lose, that's okay, too, because I've already kind of won by doing what I'm trying to do. <laughs> um, that's kind of the conversation that I would have if I'm thinking about development. Um, you know, the other end would be, you know, what's this person's UTR? What round did you make? What ranking this? What tournament did you get into? Um, you know, all of the outcome and results, like that's, that's where I feel like um, you're way too focused on the, you know, not the performance part of it. Yeah, yeah. I totally agree. Uh, especially on the, the way you shouldn't talk is I hear so many times those conversations of, oh, this person you're playing next is seated or they're ranked this or that. And it's like, <laughs> that stuff is so unhealthy and poisonous. Uh, and, you know, I advise any of my students, hey, don't look at the draw. Uh, you don't need to. Just go to the tournament desk, ask when time you play, and that's pretty much all you need to know. That's your next competitive opportunity. Like, that's all it is. And it's nothing to do with who they are or that's not going to change anything about what I do. If I think anything more into it about their UTR or their seating, all I'm going to do is overplay or underplay. And so it's uh, it's not about that. It's about me putting forward the best competitive performance that I can with everything that I've been working on in training. That's what competition is. It's an opportunity to continue to refine your training. And that's really the, at development at the end of the day. That's why you play tournaments is to see, okay, what I've been doing in practice, now can I go do it in a match? And then can I get better? And that's then you go back to the practice court and then you go out to the tournament again. So I totally agree that the verbiage is framed from the beginning. When you, before you leave for the tournament, why are we going? Is it to win it? Is it to qualify for something? Is it to, so a college will notice me? Or are we going because it's what's best for my long-term vision of the player that I want to become? And if that's the case, then what is the roadmap to get there? Is it coming in more? Is it um, being arrested with my first serve? What, what is the, the very tangible goal that I can control and analyze after the match to see if it was successful or not? Because if I go into a tournament with the only goal being winning, I'm going to fail 95% of the time. And so that's a really hard thing for anyone, but especially a teenager, to know that they're going to fail. Um, and so that's a totally different conversation of also helping, um, players through loss and learning how to deal with loss losing, because we also don't want to just say like, Hey, it's not a big deal. Like, yeah, it, it stinks to lose. And we need to give you the skills to be able to, to, uh, handle that 
the only other thing I'll share on this is just I had a front row seat to the Sheltons, uh, Brian, Lisa, uh, Ben, and Emma. So I was with them the last six or seven years here in Gainesville. And as tennis parents go, I mean, it really doesn't yeah. get too much better <laughs> in how they handled the process. And and Brian's so well accomplished in all these different areas. And, you know, seeing him have to navigate the, the coach and dad role was, you know, something that will affect me for the rest of my life as I work with my own kids in any sport, in any way. And uh, the reason I bring this example up is because Ben would go to tournaments or Emma would go to tournaments and the focus was, hey, you're going to serve in volley the whole tournament. You're going to you're going to go to an L5, which at that point in their development was below probably what they should be playing in terms of the in the eyes of the world. And he would say, hey, you're going to go in every first serve. You're going to serve volley. And that was the expectation. That was the goal. It was very tangible. We know very quickly if you did it or not. And if you did, then you're successful. If you didn't, it's no big deal. Uh, if you didn't, then that's a big deal because you didn't listen to what the goal was. And they would, Ben would come back and lose, you know, and that's a really hard lesson to understand, but it was a very tangible way for him to continue to get better and improve. And if we look at what they both ended up doing in college and where Ben is now, it's hard to argue with that long-term process that they were given um, at 15, 16, 17 years old. Yeah. But is there a point at which you do shift that focus to wins and losses because Tanner, one of the examples you gave is, you know, are we going to this tournament so that you can qualify for this next event? I mean, that's a real thing there. I mean, the way our junior comp structure is in this country is you have to make your way up the levels. You have to earn your way from you know, your sectional to nationals or from your regional to your sectional. And that can only be done through winning matches. A hundred percent. Totally agree. And that's the goal of everybody. Why else would you play than to climb the mountaintop and get to win? You know, but that's never the focus. That's never the ultimate. There's always the underlying reason of why you're there, in my opinion. I think some some people would disagree with that, that there's a, that winners win and losers lose kind of thing. But in my opinion, to free up your best competitive performances, you're always focused on what you can control and realizing that at the end of the day, you're going to play people who are going to be better than you or on that day, they're going to be better than you. And so if I ever shift my focus to wins or losses as the ultimate thing, I'm shifting it into something that I have no command over. And that to me is the most powerless place you can be as a competitor. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think as a player gets older, um, you know, I think that I'm not, I'm, I'm certainly not saying you should never focus on um, ha having result-based goals. In other words, like, I think that if you're, again, if you're sitting down and mapping out a plan, a developmental plan, I think that should include some long-term goals. Um, again, but once those goals are set, I don't, you know, focus on them day in and day out. What I focus on day in and day out is what do I have to do performance wise to get myself closer to those end goals? Um, so it's almost like the carrot dangling there, but I'm, I'm not obsessed with it, you know? And I do think that different players respond differently. So in other words, I was a player who very much would respond well to knowing the opportunity that was in front of me. Cause like, I, I just liked to know that sometimes. And I have definitely coached players where it was the opposite and I failed miserably and would tell them things that probably they should have just kept quiet <laughs> on the front end because I was like, well, I know I'd want to know, but not everyone's the same. Um, and so I think that that's where you have to know your child as a coach. That's where you have to know your player. Um, but but again, e even if it is someone that likes to know those things, you still don't want to obsess over them. Yeah. But I mean, let's you know, let's assume that everybody watching or listening to this podcast has a kid who has the goal of playing high level college tennis, whether it's D1, 2, 3, NAIA, JUCO, doesn't matter, but they, they want to play college tennis. In order to get recruited to play college tennis, there have to be some wins on the record. I mean, I, 
correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think any college coach is going to recruit a kid who doesn't know how to win tennis matches. Yeah. Uh, oh, absolutely. There has to be a starting place, right? There has to be enough there. I mean, at Florida, we, if it wasn't, if you weren't a certain tier to begin with, then we can't really look at you because there's too big of a talent gap or level gap for us to catch you up no matter what developmental tendencies are there, right? So that is important. I guess what I'm saying is just that the focus, by, by the focus being there more doesn't mean that it'll happen more. If you focus on winning more, it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll win more. And I think it's, if we're talking about winning, it's about learning how to win. And that's different than focusing on winning. Learning how to win is more strategy-based. It's more skill-based. It's figuring out how to acquire different skills in order to create issues or problems for your opponent so that you can win more frequently. Learning how to manage a match, understanding the score in certain places to be able to implement tactics. So I think there is a shift to focusing on how to win, but my focus is still not on winning itself, if that makes sense. I mean, it it makes sense. It's very complicated and it's very nuanced. And I think, you know, just speaking for myself, it was difficult to not cross that line of, you know, it's important to do well at this tournament if you want to play college tennis at this level, because coaches need to see that you know how to win in these situations. It, it's just a really difficult kind of whole world to, to navigate when the language has to be very specific, I think. And that's kind of, you know, what I'm getting from you guys today is it's it's word choices, it's phrasing choices, it's timing choices. Yeah. Uh, and I think Lisa, like, you know, if, if, if you have kind of one poor tournament, no big deal, but, but if you're consistently, like, you're just not performing to get to that next level, whatever that next level is, you're, then I think the question is like, what do, what do I have? Like, what's going on? What from, from my own like game? Is it mental? Is it emotional? Is it, is it what, what I'm doing on the court? Do, do I need to evolve my game more, for example, to be able to take it to the next level? Like there has to be something like that going on that then you can turn to go back to the drawing board, go back to the practice court and really try to address those areas and then go back to the match court because you really don't own something as a tennis player until you can do it in competition under pressure. Like that's when you can say, I have that thing, but that's the last step in this long process of owning something in your game. And so, you know, I, I actually coached, um, I'm not gonna, certainly not gonna say any names, but I coached a young girl who was super successful in the 12s and 14s, like at the national level, winning big time tournaments. And then um, I coached an event where she played up. And so she actually ended up playing uh, very high on our team, but was now playing 17 year olds going to college. And her game, it became so obvious that like she needed to do things on the court that she couldn't yet do that these 17 year olds could do, they were bigger, stronger, faster, and had the ability to come forward and, and bigger serves, all these things. And I think it was a moment of like, okay, what wins at one age group or at one level doesn't always you know, translate. You have to be willing to almost take one step back for two steps forward. And so that's kind of what I'm saying. Like if, if you're hitting that stretch where you're just not getting the results, then what do we need to address and go work on it you know, and, and evolve your game? So, I mean, as a college coach, when you're looking at junior players that want to come play for you, the good coaches we know aren't focused on ratings and rankings and wins and losses. They're, they're looking for these kind of intangibles. Um, can you speak, can you both speak to that a little bit? Like what are those intangibles and how, let's say, I, I understand that at University of Florida or at Yale, there is a level that's the minimum level that's acceptable to be a playing member of the team. But how do you know if a kid's 
reach that level yet, or if you're going to be able to get them to that level, or if they have time to reach that level by the time they matriculate on campus. I mean, there's just so much we don't know. And I think that for me was why focusing on wins and losses and ratings and rankings became so front of mind because it was this tangible thing that I could look at and, and use as a comparator. Who's going first? Go? <laughs> either, either way, I'll, I'll go. Um, okay. So for me personally, as a college coach, uh, it didn't matter the level. The first thing for me was character. And that was that was the first wall to get through, right? So it doesn't matter if you're a 13 UTR or a 9 UTR. If you didn't have the character piece, then you weren't on the table in terms of recruiting. There was no compromising that area because at the end of the day, this is not about you in college. It's about the team. And certainly there's individual components to that. Um, of which the coaches will help you develop, but you're a team player first. And so I always had the vision of having a culture or a group of, of players that were all bought into the same things and had that brand that I've referred to of what they stand for. What are the things that are so important to them? They will never violate that. And I'm not saying that they're perfect, right? They're, they might have uh, issues with their temper. They might have things going on, but they know that those things are holding them back and they want to work on them. So that's that's kind of the character piece. They're acknowledging that they have maybe weaknesses in those areas or deficiencies that they want to continue to, continue to improve. How did um, you assess that though? Seeing them in the most stressful environments and seeing them in their most comfortable environments. Um, and so the most stressful environment is competition, typically. And so you see how they react and respond to pressure. And then their most comfortable environment is their home and seeing how they interact with their parents, seeing how they interact with the relationships that they are the most ingrained to, because that is when you see the true habits come out. Everyone can put on a face for a certain amount of time, just like I can as a college coach. But when I see you interact with those that you know the best, that's going to give me a really good indicator of who you are on the inside. And so it was both of those used in unison to kind of create a character evaluation of how I felt you would fit on the team. Danielle. Yeah. I mean, just to add to that, um, some things that we similarly like character was a huge thing, um, is watching them when maybe they didn't know you were watching them. So if you're at a tournament and they're playing some consolation match in the back courts and they think no one's there, I would love to watch them play then and see, you know, how are they handling that situation? The other time I feel like sometimes uh, recruits can sort of let their guard down is if they're on campus visits and they're with the players on your team. Um, like if they were to spend the night uh, they're going to probably act a little bit differently with the players than maybe they would with the coaches. And then I would rely heavily on our players for feedback on just like, what do you think about this person? And um, would they fit in with the culture of our team? So those are just some other things. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I there is definitely like a level that I feel like at, depending on the school that you're looking at, you need to be at least within range. And but the, the thing about college tennis and the beauty of it is that there's a wide range of levels. So yeah. it doesn't just have to be the Florida men's team winning a national championship. I mean, sure, we would all love that, but that's for like a very select group, small group of people. I mean, there's division one and even within division one, there's a huge range of schools and then all of the other divisions as well. So I feel like there's a fit for everyone if you're willing to kind of cast that wide net, which we talked about before, Lisa, um, and not just be so narrow, narrowly focused. Um, but assuming that you're even within striking range of the level of that particular school, I would always try to figure out like, what's the potential that this person has? Like, what's their love of the game? Um, do I think they're on the rise or have, are they kind of burnt out going down and they're going to just kind of coast? How I would do that um, is I would do kind of a lot of research. I would look and see trends like, you know, are they are they trending upward? I don't care where you are right now in rating, but like, have you been improving over time or is it kind of the other way around? Um, so things like that to try to gauge, you know, just talking to them, like you can get a sense of if someone really loves tennis or not. Um, 
I would like to talk to people that maybe had coached them. So if I saw that they played something like a team event, a USTA team event, and I knew or I could figure out who coached that team, um, having coached those teams myself, I know how much, how well you get to know those players in those few days, because you not only are on court with them, but you're, um, you know, going to meals and all of this. I would call those coaches and I would say, hey, I saw you coached Fed Cup with so-and-so. I was just curious what that experience was like. So any kind of research <laughs> that I could do to try to figure out what's this person like would only help us make the best decisions. But even then, you know, it's, it's the million dollar question, recruiting stuff. So, yeah. And I think to piggyback on that, every interaction you have as a, as a prospective student athlete matters to Daniel's point there, because you never know who knows who, who knows who, and it's going to be that one person that you didn't give the time of day to. And other than just being a good person and a good human being, like this is, this is your brand. This is your personal brand and your personal network at the end of the day. And everyone that you treat well throughout the process and has a positive interaction with you just keeps all of the doors open. And so uh, that's a big piece of advice for kids is just making sure that they don't, um, they, they always keep their brand in mind when it comes to making decisions because it is their brand. And once you have a brand that stands for something, it's really hard to undo what that brand stands for. Yeah, I love that. Um, so one last question, because we're coming to the end of our hour, but Danielle, you mentioned watching a backdraw match as, as yeah. a recruiting coach. The, the question of playing the backdraw is like, I mean, it comes up so often and, you know, there's all the, these issues with ducking because if I play this match, you know, it's going to negatively impact my rating and, you know, yeah. unless I win 0-0 and, and so I'm just not going to play or there are not enough ranking points on the line to warrant me spending another day at this event. And um, so in terms of, again, focusing on long-term development versus focusing on ratings, rankings, wins, losses, what does playing the backdraw mean? So I think my personal opinion is when you sign up for a tournament, unless you're injured and physically, you know, will harm yourself by continuing to play that once, when you sign up, you play it out, you see it through. I think that that's, um, you know, even if it's a tough thing to do, maybe you took a bad loss and now you're in the backdrop where you don't want to be playing players that, you know, are lower than you or whatever the case may be. Like there's still value. Every time you go out on the court, it's a chance to get better. It's a chance to learn. It's a chance to experience something new, be in a pressure situation. Like, you can always take something from a match. Um, I think it's a terrible look. Uh, I think co for me personally, if I saw someone consistently pulling out of a back, back draws, I would definitely raise a red flag and want to know more about that. Because if it's because they're you know, trying to avoid a tough situation, well, that's exactly what we're gonna have you in when you're in college. You know, you're, you're, you might be the last one on the court in a three, three match with it all on the line and how are you going to perform? Like, I can't have you pulling out. <laughs> um, so, you know, you learn a lot about someone. I feel like their character, their grit, their resilience when you are in the back draw and it's not as glamorous and you're just grinding out there. Um, I think I, I used to love that. Like those the national clay courts in Memphis, Tennessee, it's a thousand degrees. You're on some dirt court in a park with nobody around and it's like yeah I really want to see how how you respond to that like that that shows me a lot so Tanner anything to add I, I just always find it interesting when players lose their luster after losing a match you know because it the next match is no different it's just because it's perceived differently you know and so I think when I see kids that are just as excited about the opportunity that they have in the match after they lost one just because it's called a backdraw or a consolation. Um, I love that because they appreciate the opportunities that they're given and they love to compete. And the ones that love to compete are going to be the best players in college because they are going to have to constantly compete in practice, in matches. And so that is a really good characteristic to have um, if you're a college coach looking for a player. And so I think, you know, there's obviously nuances to this with injuries, uh, like Danielle said, and if you're at play courts in Delray and it's rained for three days straight and it's just time to go, 
you know, we certainly understand that, but if it becomes a pattern, that I think is when it's the concerning thing for us as coaches. And, you know, for any junior players listening, just remember what it was like to play your first tournament. Remember what it was like to play your first national, your first super national. I always challenge the guys on our team when they played their first futures, when they played their first challenger, don't lose that joy. Don't lose what it means to play the backdrop of a super national like that is such an honor to even get to do that and it's the same for l5 and l7 it is such an honor to get to compete and play and if you remember what it was like that first time you would have been so excited to play that backdrop match and get another chance to play that i'm oh my goodness i get to play tennis again and for those that that are struggling with that just really try to recapture what those memories were and refresh those experiences in your in your mind to help you perceive those those opportunities the right way. I love that. I love that. All right. So winding down here, um, Tanner, quickly, anything that I have neglected to ask that you would like to share and also let us know how parents can find you. Yeah, I don't think there's anything that's been neglected. I'm sure there's plenty more that we can mm-hmm. discuss and talk about and, and unpack. Because like you said, it's such a tricky area. Um, you know, I think that the, my parting advice is just communication. Um, listen to your kids. Have an ear open at all times to hear what they're experiencing from their coaches, to hear what they're experiencing from their peers, because that is going to be a very good barometer of the kinds of things that are being put into them in terms of the advice that they're being given. And so if you have those clear lines of communication, you can solve a lot of problems. So I think that that as a parent is is uh, is paramount and first and foremost. In terms of how people can find me, uh, my website is uh, collegetenniscrashcourse.com. And uh, for any coaches that are out there that want to continue their education and, and uh, have additional resources, that's a great place to find me. And then if anyone is interested in in consulting or recruiting advice, they can find me there as well, um, as well as on slamstocks.com. Awesome. Awesome. Danielle? Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I would add is for a parent that's looking for some actionable things that they can take from this, um, maybe they they are really bought into this language and they want to focus on performance. Um, if your if your child doesn't already have a developmental plan written out with his or her coach, I would strongly suggest that. Um, and if you don't know where to go for that or what that would look like, just Google USTA player development uh, de- plan, and they have they'll come up. Um, they also have a great journal. So if you Google USTA player development journal, um, that those are things that I've used with players in the past. It, it helps um, in terms of both the long-term plan, but then also the day-to-day before they go to practice, coming up with these performance objectives and before matches as well, so that they are focusing on the, the right things versus the results. I think that's one thing that you could actually take and go put into action. Um, so yeah, that, that would be my, my parting advice. I love it. And how can oh, parents find right. you? Um, so my website is DLM, my initials, dlmcoaching.com. Uh, and I also have a college tennis recruiting newsletter, which is, uh, you can find it from that website, but it's also, it's, it's a Substack newsletter. So if you just Google or look up DLM coaching on Substack, you'll see the college tennis recruiting newsletter with lots of tips and advice. Yeah. And it's, I speak from advice. It is really, really awesome. She gives you very specific things to do and ask and look for. And um, yeah, everybody that has the dream of playing college tennis for sure needs to sign up for the newsletter. It's free, right? Um, Yep. Yep. Um, And take advantage of the expertise of these two awesome humans that are uh, on air with us this week. Um, one last thing I, I just thought of as you guys were talking, and it's the whole notion of taking time off and that that is a bad thing that, you know, letting kids take a break from training or take a break from playing tournaments is a bad thing. And especially given the timing of this podcast, we're coming into summer. Um, there are kids that want to go to summer camp that has nothing to do with tennis, or they want to go 
pursue playing an instrument or some other creative outlet that has nothing to do with tennis. Good thing or bad thing? Great thing. <laughs> That's what I would say. I mean, yeah, I think sometimes less is more, as they say. Um, it's good to have balance and it's good to want to be on the tennis court, right? I feel like you're sometimes getting getting away from it a little bit and then coming back refreshed and excited. You're going to be so much more productive um, and happy. So absolutely, I mean, you only get a, a chance to be a kid once. And so it's, it's going to a summer camp or taking a little bit of a break, going on a family vacation, that is not going to harm your college recruiting options one bit. <laughs> so... It's a great thing. Tanner, agree? T totally agree. Follow follow the passions. Wherever the passion lies, if the passion is still a tennis and they want to keep going, then go with that. If it's something else to take a break and get a different view at something else to come back to tennis, that's great too. So just follow, follow, the, follow the heart, I guess, if you will. Yeah, love it. Love it. Well, you guys have been amazing. I, this was a great conversation as I knew it would be. Um, I would love to have you back and keep digging into this whole notion of development versus outcome. And I think it's a really important conversation to keep going and growing um, and to help parents with the language and, and with the kind of signposts of things to look for and red flags and things like that. Um, so I hope you'll come back and let's do this again. But uh, I will have links to both websites and the show notes on parentingaces.com. So listeners, please check that out. Thank you both so, so, so much. And to my listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. And we will catch you next time on Parenting Aces. <laughs>